every great thinker throughout the course of human history has had something to say about happiness. This is the question that Jim wanted to answer. What is the best way to dramatize Tucson's plural society for the greatest possible number of Tucsonans? Things are impermanent. Things are constantly changing. Nothing is the same across time. That's one element of the Buddhist belief. We are going to explore these, these issues of how the fact that there is a mediator between us and a company, which is the internet, affects our uh, privacy issues. So I think if we're going to be up in arms about a foreign entity uh, trying to manipulate us, we ought to pay more attention to, to domestic uh, influences as well. All right, so that style of music, again, associated with northern Mexico, the borderlands. But the performer of that particular song is not a person of Mexican descent. It's Beyonce Knowles Carter. About half of us have chosen to share our lives and open up our homes to the evolutionary descendants of gray wolves. African American women's language is not black male speech. Black women have started loving themselves loudly. We all desire to see peace in the world, but if we truly want to end suffering, our work must be grounded in justice. We often imagine sexuality as an identity-based word or that it's something about our intimacies. But when we look around, we think about healthcare, when we think about marriage, when we think about public health, these are all places where our sexuality as individuals and as a group get really messy and blurry. My name is Eric Plemons. I'm an associate professor in the School of Anthropology, the University of Arizona, and I am the curator of the Downtown Lecture Series this year. And I often say, as an anthropologist, you always want to study a controversy because that's why you know that something really matters to people. The fingers on the dragon go snap, 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 snap. I'm Harris Kornstein, and I am an assistant professor of public and applied humanities at the University of Arizona. For the downtown lecture series, I'm looking at drag, and that's something that I've looked at in a couple of different ways. One is to look at the way that drag queens perform their fabulous selves online through social media platforms. I'm interested in the ways that drag performers is really trick systems. They like drag makeup and how that can be used to thwart facial recognition. I'll also be talking a bit about my work with Drag Queen Story Hour. It's drag queens, drag kings, drag performers of all kinds, reading books to children in libraries, schools, community centers. Once upon a time. So we really try to use, you know, social justice children's literature to, to you know, invite discussion about sometimes difficult topics in society. I research early California, and so I'm focusing in particular in post-Gold Rush California, a time of great flux and tremendous change. My name is Erica Perez. I'm an associate professor of history here at the University of Arizona. Almost overnight, California multiplied its population, and that led to certain shifts in land use, in political power, but most importantly in social relations between those who had already resided in California and those who were newly entering the region. Because the gold rush tends to bring in much more men than they do women, women are faced with certain limitations. And so my research and the subject of my talk is really examining some of these events that are expressed through legal cases, criminal cases, even in the media, these accounts of seduction, breach of marriage promise cases, rape cases, any number of sex crimes. I think the study of sexuality is a really serious lens from which to evaluate American history. It reveals dimensions of power and asymmetry. It reveals racial dynamics, ethnicity. And it also gets us thinking about the fact that there is no monolithic sexual culture in this country, and there never has been. I think that we're in a crisis point uh, since the 
Supreme Court decision in the Dobbs case. My name is Louise Roth. I am a professor of sociology and I study gender law organizations and reproduction. So one important aspect of reproductive justice is ensuring that everyone has access to the reproductive health care that they need. And of course, in the United States, not everyone has access to health care that they need. Another thing that I really want people to understand is that outlawing abortion doesn't just outlaw abortion. It has... Whose do we get to talk about? I work with teachers and in communities to look at the ways in which we can make schools not just safer for LGBTQ youth, but spaces where they can thrive. My name is Carol Brochin. I'm an associate professor in the College of Education in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Social Cultural Studies. In my talk, I'll give examples of stories from youth that I've met about what really transformative classrooms have looked like for them. I'll share some stories from teachers who have taken risks and shown up for LGBTQ youth in ways that I think other people can learn from. I believe in the power of stories to build collectives, and I hope that I can inspire some people to think about our communities in ways that, that they can learn to care for them and show up for them. What makes the, the approaches taken by social scientists unique and engaging is that we put people at the center of the conversation. So it's not about making a point, but instead, what are the concerns, what are the issues that are helping to shape this reality the way that we're living it? And better understanding each of those things help us better understand the problem. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lori Plony Stauninger, and I'm the Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the University of Arizona's People College. I'm very pleased to welcome you live and on stage tonight to our 10th annual downtown lecture series. Over the last couple of weeks, we've explored the cultural impacts of drag performance and 19th century sex scandals. Tonight's we'll examine reproductive justice, and in our final lecture, we'll explore how gender and sexuality are taught or are not taught in our schools. And as a friendly reminder, our final lecture will be, will be next Tuesday on November 1st. This year's downtown lecture series is focused on sexualities and is curated by Eric Plemons. Eric is a medical anthropologist focused on the practice of transgender medicine and surgery. His first book, The Look of a Woman, examines facial feminization surgery, a series of bone and soft tissue reconstructive surgeries intended to feminize the faces of trans women. Can we give Eric a round of applause for the wonderful job he's done curating the series? Before we get started this evening, I'd take, like to take a moment to thank a few people. First, to our series sponsor, Rick and Bill Small and the Stonewall Fund at the Community Foundation of Southern Arizona. Since its formation over 45 years ago, the Stonewall Foundation has given nearly $50 million to the Tucson community. Founded in 1972, the Stonewall Foundation initially funded 10 nonprofit organizations in Tucson and in Southern Arizona. That expanded to nearly 20 by the time the foundation was turned into a donor advised fund at the Community Foundation for Southern Arizona. In that time, the foundation was able to provide emergency funding for many organizations that it had annually funded and also provide special COVID funding, which allowed several organizations to remain open during the pandemic. As a donor advised fund at the Community Foundation, the advisors of the fund continue to support the same organizations as before and add several others to the annual mix of recipients for funding, including SBS. Annual funding from the Stonewall Foundation totals approximately $700,000 per year. Can we give them a round of applause? Yeah. 
thanks go out as well to our community sponsors, Joanne Ellison and Dr. Barbara Sterrett, who have supported the Downtown Lecture Series since its inception in 2013. And finally, thanks to our media sponsor, Tucson Lifestyle. Can we have a round of applause for all our sponsors? Now tonight I have the extreme pleasure of introducing Dr. Louise Roth, the author of several books and articles, as well as National Science Foundation funded research. Dr. Roth is a sociologist who studies how organizations and laws influence justice and quality of life for women. In her first book, Selling Women Short, Gender and Money on Wall Street, Dr. Roth examined the effects of law and organizations on gender inequality in employment. Her primary focus in this line of research has been the systematically unequal effects of pay systems that rely on performance evaluations and are supposed to reward workers based on merit. Dr. Roth is an expert on gender and racial bias in hiring, work assignments, evaluations, and promotion. Her forthcoming book, Reproductive Regimes, Birth Malpractice and the Maternity Care Business in the United States, analyzes the effects of regulate medical malpractice and reproductive rights laws on maternity care practices in the United States. Tonight, Dr. Roth will share with us some of her work. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Louise Roth to the stage. Thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you all for being here tonight. I'm excited about talking to you about reproductive justice. You might wonder why reproductive justice in a series on sexuality, but by the late 20th century, most of us took for granted something that earlier generations had not even heard of, which was that we could and even should have fulfilling sexual lives without necessarily procreating. The availability of effective contraception and legal abortion made it possible for the first time to separate heterosexual activity from reproduction and marriage. The Supreme Court decisions in Griswold v. Connecticut, and this photo shows Griswold here in 1965, and Roe v. Wade made contraception and abortion legal in the United States. Of course, sexual activity still risks pregnancy for many people. But the adoption of contraception and abortion uh, meant that people could explore all kinds of new sexual relationships. Artificial reproductive technology also has meant that people could procreate without sexual activity. So in the bigger picture, we see connections between human sexuality and contraception, abortion, birth, and artificial reproductive technologies. As many have said before me, uh, people who get abortions and people who have babies are not different people. They're the same people at different points in their lives. In my children's sex education class, they said it takes an egg, a sperm, and a uterus to make a baby. There are now a variety of ways to bring those things together. People who can get pregnant, of course, include trans and non-binary people. I'm mainly going to talk about women today. Now, not everyone has been happy about these developments, about the fact that people can have uh, sexual activity without procreating, without being married. Uh, there have been religious communities and social movements that have protested the availability of contraception, and especially abortion. And they have encouraged legislatures to develop state-level abortion restrictions, some organizations have fought the contraceptive mandate in the Affordable Care Act. And governments have uh, supported abstinence-based sex education programs that are not supported by evidence. Reproductive health laws and policies have unequal effects across the population. They have a huge impact on people, but they differentially affect people depending on their age their race, ethnicity, their education, and their income. Unless we forget about patriarchy, they also disproportionately affect women. 
Patriarchy literally means rule by the father, but it's often used to describe a system of male dominance and institutional sexism. In fact, people who study institutional sexism argue that restricting reproductive health access, including access to abortion, is one of the key elements of institutional sexism. Of course, it's also manifested in gender inequality in political, social, and economic structures. And it's important to note that reproductive health policies have been very strongly connected to institutional racism in this country as well. If you look at the history of forced childbearing under slavery for African American women, um, and also the forced sterilization of uh, populations of color in this country, throughout the period after the Civil War and even up until very recently, there were, have been reports of uh, forced hysterectomies in ICE detention centers. So uh, the history of forced sterilization and forced childbearing led a group of women of color to reframe the debate over reproductive rights in terms of reproductive justice. A reproductive justice framework focuses on supporting not only the right to choose when and if to procreate, but also the right to parent with dignity. The right to parent with dignity, which requires equal access to contraception and abortion, but also freedom from coerced sterilization, a living wage, food security, freedom from violence, and a safe environment in which to raise children. I became interested in reproduction uh, through my own reproductive journey. For many of us, our reproductive lives are a journey. Many of us spend a lot of time trying not to get pregnant or stay pregnant, or maybe trying not to get someone else pregnant. And then we may spend some time trying to get pregnant and stay pregnant. My first pregnancy ended in a common everyday miscarriage, like 15% of pregnancies. It was very early, most people didn't know that I was pregnant, um, and I knew that I could try again. I did get pregnant again. I thought everything was fine. Um, my partner and I were very excited to go to our 20-week ultrasound. When we went, we were thinking that we were gonna see the baby, but what we saw was that there was no heartbeat. The ultrasound technician told us that there had been an intrauterine fetal demise. This was an emotionally devastating and traumatic experience. I then had to check into the hospital where they induced labor. I spent 24 hours waiting and then had a stillborn female fetus. I became part of a group that I didn't know existed and I didn't ever want to be part of. Uh, I joined a support group. I got a plaque at the Children's Memorial Park. I joined the Walk to Remember. And because I am privileged and have a good job with excellent insurance, I got to see some perinatal specialists. And they did a full genetic workup. Uh, my insurance covered it. They did what they could to reassure me that I would have a better outcome next time. And in my next pregnancy, I saw a perinatal specialist who gave me a sonogram at every appointment to reassure me that my baby was still alive. So I had, I had good care and I had good support. No one gave me unauthorized tests for drugs. Uh, no one accused me of murdering my baby. And no one told me that it was my fault that uh, my baby had died. The closest thing I came to that was there was a nurse in the hospital who suggested that um, it might have been, my miscarriage might have been caused by the fact that I was still drinking tea. Uh, once the, the coffee started to turn my stomach, I, I still drank tea, uh, and my partner gave her a piece of his mind, and she shut up after that. Uh, I kept grieving my baby girl, and I went on to give birth to four boys. They are now ages nine to 18. And my interest in studying reproduction came from this, my birth story, my reproductive journey. Uh, but I also recognized that I had a huge amount of privilege in this situation, in being supported, in having insurance that would cover 
all of these extra services um, and having the support that I did. And if you look at reproductive justice, you have to think about what happens to people when they are low income, when they're on Medicaid or don't have insurance at all. Um, if I had been on Medicaid, would, would they have paid for a full panel of genetic testing? Would they have authorized extra treatment the next time? Would they have sent me to the perinatal specialist who could reassure me with an ultrasound once a month? Or would they have tested me for alcohol and drugs, maybe without my consent? That is something that has happened in many cases. In fact, there are states that have mandatory drug testing laws and have prosecuted women um, who took drugs when they were pregnant. Uh, there were four women who were charged with child neglect within a one month period in Ardmore, Oklahoma. This is three of them. Um, they gave birth to babies who, were test who tested positive for methamphetamine. They then faced sentences of up to life in prison. Their babies were taken away from them. They were not offered treatment for substance use disorder. Um, they were separated from their babies, which we know what babies need most is their mothers. And this happened even though their babies are still alive. Now, of course, no one would argue that it's a good idea to use substances like methamphetamine during pregnancy, but it's a big leap from that to an accusation and prosecution for child neglect, abuse, or murder. And yet, hundreds of cases in this country have done exactly that, have prosecuted women for their pregnancy outcomes. Most of the women that have been prosecuted have been low-income women and often women of color who are more likely to be su suspected of using substances during pregnancy in the first place. So if I were a low-income woman of color, would my providers have reassured me that there was nothing I could have done to have a better outcome other than, you know, the tea? Uh, or would they have accused me of doing something to jeopardize my pregnancy? One early case involved a woman named Regina McKnight in South Carolina. She was charged with murder in 1991 after she had a stillbirth. She was a very low-income African-American woman who had ex very little education. Uh, she was addicted to cocaine. And a jury, she was not a sympathetic defendant. A jury in the case convicted her of homicide and sentenced her to 20 years in prison. She served eight years before she was released. Cocaine is not a good idea in pregnancy, but it doesn't cause stillbirth. And yet, this woman spent eight years in prison instead of being offered treatment for her um, drug use disorder. There was another case in Mississippi, this one was in 2007, involving a 16-year-old girl named Rennie Gibbs. Uh, Rennie Gibbs was a low-income African-American teenager, and she gave birth to a stillborn baby that had the umbilical cord wrapped around the ne its neck. When the coroner returned the test results, they said that it was probably the umbilical cord around the neck that caused the stillbirth. But they also found a cocaine byproduct in the baby's blood. The state of Mississippi then charged Rennie Gibbs, 16 years old, with depraved heart murder, and she was sentenced to life in prison. She served seven years before the court dismissed the charge. And it's important to note, Mississippi doesn't have very good maternal and infant outcomes. It actually has the highest maternal and infant mortality rates in the US, comparable to Botswana, which is a very poor country. They offer no sex education, they have the highest poverty rate in the US, the highest teen pregnancy rate, and the highest high school dropout rate. Yet they spent their resources prosecuting uh, a 16-year-old girl for an unavoidable stillbirth uh, and imprisoning her for seven years. I'm going to give you one more case like this. 
This is Brittany Pula, and this is a recent case. She was 19 years old and had a second trimester miscarriage in 2021. Brittany Pula is a member of the Comanche Nation in Oklahoma. Her miscarriage occurred at 15 to 17 weeks pregnancy, so very much before viability. And the fetus had a congenital abnormality, but they also found methamphetamine in Brittany Pula's blood. And the state of Oklahoma blamed the, still, the miscarriage on methamphetamine and prosecuted her for manslaughter. A jury convicted her of first-degree manslaughter and sentenced her to four years in prison. And the National Advocates for Pregnant Women, a legal organization that has worked on many of these cases, is currently working to get her released. So this uh, young woman is in prison for having a miscarriage. Again, there was a congenital ab abnormality. This was not really an avoidable miscarriage. These cases show us some of the ways that when we give fetuses rights or when we emphasize um, fetuses as separate from their mothers, we start to see pregnant women losing their rights. Another way that we see this happen is through feticide cases. And many states passed feticide laws in order to treat a homicide of a pregnant victim as an aggravated crime. So the purpose was uh, to increase the penalty for uh, murdering a pregnant woman, not to charge pregnant women with murder. However, they have been used to prosecute women for terminating a pregnancy or experiencing a stillbirth. Another example from Oklahoma shows this. It, was, it involved a woman named Latisse Fisher, who was a mother of three and was 35 weeks pregnant when she experienced a stillbirth at home in 2017. Her husband called 911. The EMTs went to her home and found a premature baby without a heartbeat. They took her to the emergency department for aftercare, and while she was there, she admitted to a nurse that she didn't want and could not afford another child. The nurse then reported her to law enforcement, and the state of Mississippi prosecuted her for second-degree murder. She faced a possible sentence of 20 to 40 years, but her, her case was dismissed in 2020. Feticide laws were not intended to prosecute women for murder after they had a miscarriage, an abortion, or a stillbirth, but they have been used for that. Uh, this is Pervy Patel. In 2013, she used an abortion pill that she had purchased from an online pharmacy in Hong Kong to terminate her pregnancy. She lived in Indiana. Indiana has pretty strict uh, feticide laws as well as anti-abortion uh, restrictions. She went to the emergency department because she had excessive bleeding and she needed some um, post-abortion care. But the emergency department suspected that her miscarriage was not a spontaneous one and, and reported her to law enforcement. And the state of Indiana then prosecuted her for feticide. She was given a sentence of 20 years for inducing her own abortion. On appeal, the court overturned the feticide sentence, but it upheld a child neglect sentence and downgraded her sentence from 20 years to 18 months, which she had already served, so she was released. Again, this was not a viable fetus. This was someone who induced her own abortion, and yet she was still um, charged with child neglect. Feticide laws have also been used to punish women for tragic outcomes where they were the victim. This is a photo of Marsha Jones. And in 2018, she was five months pregnant when she had an altercation with a coworker outside a Dollar General store in Alabama. Her coworker, Ebony Jemison, shot her while she was in her car. The shot struck her abdomen and caused a miscarriage. What do you think the state of Alabama should have done in that case? Well, they declined to prosecute Ebony Jemison because she claimed that she felt threatened and Alabama has a stand your ground law. 
So instead, they, tr they prosecuted Marsha Jones for manslaughter, saying that she knowingly endangered her pregnancy by, I don't know, sitting in her car. Um, and so they prosecuted her instead. This strikes me as a particularly illogical outcome, but it does fit with a culture that cares more about fetal rights and gun rights than it does about reproductive justice. I'm gonna leave you with one more example involving feticide laws, and that is the case of Bebe Shuai. She was a Chinese immigrant who lived in Indiana, and she suffered from severe depression. In January of 2011, she attempted to commit suicide by ingesting rat poison. At that time, she was 32 weeks pregnant. She was rushed to the emergency department where they did an emergency disease section to get the baby out. Uh, she survived. Her baby died two days after the birth. Then the state of Indiana charged her with murder and attempted feticide. Even though her intention was to kill herself and not specifically her fetus, uh, they also did not offer her psychiatric help or emotional support, which were two things she obviously needed. Uh, instead, she spent 435 days in prison before pleading guilty to a lesser charge of criminal recklessness in 2013. She was then released. Legal cases like this exist because some people and some laws treat fetuses as persons and treat pregnant women as a threat to them instead of as their staunchest defenders. Uh, and this is a logical extension of efforts to restrict access to abortion. Abortion is controversial. That will come as news to no one. A majority of Americans support its legality, but many also oppose it under some circumstances. There is, of course, a politically powerful group that opposes abortion under all circumstances and has passed state laws that restrict abortion access. They've also ultimately been successful in overturning Roe v. Wade with the recent Dobbs decision. That was June 2022. You probably were paying attention to that. Even before the Dobbs decision, though, many states, including Arizona, passed laws that limited abortion access. In fact, the anti-abortion movement had a tactic of chipping away at abortion access with little um, laws that they passed whenever they could to try to restrict abortion access. The anti-abortion movement's position is usually framed as an issue of protecting human life and granting fetal personhood. But sometimes it's hard to see how giving fetuses personhood rights takes rights away from pregnant women, takes away pregnant women's rights to personhood. We can see this pretty clearly, though, when we look at cases involving forced and court-ordered C-sections. Court-ordered C-sections violate pregnant women's right to bodily integrity and informed consent. Mentally competent adults have a legal right to refuse treatment and do not lose that right due to pregnancy. The courts have affirmed this. And yet, courts have, have permitted some hospitals and providers to obtain court orders to allow them to do a C-section without the pregnant woman's consent. One of the earlier cases like this involved a woman named Angela Carter, and it happened in 1987. Angela Carter, this is a photo of her at her wedding. Um, Angela Carter was a cancer survivor who had been in remission from cancer for quite a while when she got married. She was very delighted when she found out she was pregnant, but then her cancer returned during her pregnancy. Her doctors wanted to keep her alive as long as possible. They knew that the cancer was terminal. And she wanted to live long enough to hold her baby. But the hospital that she was going to felt like it was their responsibility to get her baby out before she died. And so at 26 weeks of pregnancy, which is very much on the borderline of viability, uh, it's extremely premature, the hospital obtained a court order 
Angela Carter, her husband, her parents, and her doctors, both her cancer doctor and her obstetrician, um, opposed the idea of her having a C-section at this point. But the hospital obtained its court order and found a doctor who would perform the C-section. Both Angela Carter and her baby died within 48 hours of the surgery. Her parents sued the hospital and won, and the court reaffirmed that it is not legal to perform surgery on a competent adult without their, without their consent, even if they're pregnant. Still, at least a dozen states have obtained court orders to force unwilling pregnant women to have C-sections um, since then. And uh, even though it's not legal to force someone to have surgery, they have succeeded in getting these court orders. One case from Pennsylvania in 2004 involved a woman named Amber Marlowe who'd already had several children and was pregnant. And they told her at, the hosp at her local hospital that her baby was too big and she needed to have a C-section. She said, I've had big babies before. I don't see why I should have to do this. The hospital then went and obtained a court order so that when she arrived to give birth, they could do the C-section. Amber Marlowe, smart woman, went to a different hospital and had a healthy vaginal birth with no complications, showing that the doctors were wrong about her need to have surgery. It's important to note that courts can't legally require individuals to undergo any other medical procedure, like donating a kidney, for another person's benefit, even if the other person might die as a result. And yet they have been willing in many cases to grant these court orders requiring pregnant women to undergo cesarean surgery. Another case involved Laura Pemberton in 1996 in Tallahassee, Florida. She had had a previous cesarean and wanted to have a vaginal birth after cesarean, also known as a VBAC. The doctors in Tallahassee's hospital told her that they would not permit her to have a trial of labor in their hospital, so she opted instead to give birth with a midwife at home. She wanted to try, at least, to have a, a VBAC. However, while she was in labor, she started to get dehydrated and went to the hospital to get IV fluids. As soon as she got to the hospital, they told her she needed immediately to have a C-section. And so she fled the hospital and went back home. A little while later, the sheriff and the state's attorney showed up at her house. They strapped her legs together and they took her to the hospital, into the OR, and forcibly performed a C-section. The hospital had appointed a, an attorney for her fetus but not for her. During the procedure, she said repeatedly, I do not consent, I do not consent, I do not consent. She then sued the hospital, but she lost. The court decided that the state's interest in the well-being of a viable fetus outweighed her rights to informed consent and bodily integrity. This is another woman who wanted a VBAC by the name of Renat Dre. She was in New York. She had had two previous C-sections and she had had uh, difficult recoveries after those C-sections. And she told the doctor at Staten Island uh, University Hospital that she wanted to try to have a VBAC. She wanted a trial of labor. They didn't like that idea and tried to convince her otherwise. But she said, no, this is what I want. She arrived at the hospital in labor, and the obstetrician told her that her uterus was likely to rup rupture if she did not have a cesarean, and he threatened to report her for child endangerment and have her baby taken away. The likelihood of a, of a uterine rupture is higher after two C-sections, but it's not high. It's still actually quite low. But the director of maternal medicine wrote in her medical record that Dre had decisional capacity, but I have decided to override her refusal to have a C-section. He wrote it down. They forcibly performed the C-section and the surgery lacerated Dre's bladder. It required extensive surgical repair. 
She sued the hospital for malpractice, but she lost in 2014. The New York District Court once again voted, uh, ruled in favor of the hospital, arguing that the state's interest in the well-being of a fetus, a uh, viable fetus, overrides a mother's rights to informed consent. And that was upheld by the appellate court in 2018. These cases show how, what happens when we give rights to fetuses and um, as separate from their mothers. This is the problem with what I call fetus-centered logic. Pregnancy is a big commitment and a lot of things can go wrong. I could give you many more examples, but what I want you to take away is that women and their families need to be able to make these decisions. They need to be able to make their reproductive decisions for themselves. And what's happened is we have this whole set of laws and hospital policies that take those, pol that take those decisions away. And those policies can lead to preventable maternal deaths like the death of Savita Halepanavar in Ireland. She was a 31-year-old who was having a second trimester miscarriage and the hospital would not assist her in completing the miscarriage safely. And because they would not assist her, she died of septic shock. Her case was the catalyst for Ireland to liberalize its abortion laws. But her case also shows a common problem that we see in Catholic hospitals. Doctors in Catholic hospitals are not permitted to help with a miscarriage when there is a fetal heartbeat. Many women have been turned away from Catholic hospitals told to go home and come back when you're really sick, have a fever. We're hearing more reports of similar things happening, perhaps in non-Catholic hospitals, since the Dobbs decision. Doctors just don't know what they're allowed to do. It's, it, it really makes it hard for them to provide what we would consider to be evidence-based. Again, these examples show how laws and policies that aim to protect fetuses as separate from their mothers, as separate persons, justify denying pregnant women's rights. Pregnant women lose the fundamental rights that ought and equal protection. This is what ideas of fetal personhood do under patriarchy. Abortion restrictions undermine public health while supporting patriarchy. Mortality rates and higher rates of preterm birth and low birth weights that granted personhood to embryos and fetuses. The courts blocked that law. But then a more recent law in 2022 bans all abortions after 15 weeks. It's in effect, it has not been blocked. Most people don't know if their pregnancies involve serious fetal anomalies until after 15 weeks. So this law makes it very difficult for anyone who experiences a pregnancy gone wrong to figure out what their options are. Perhaps they have to travel to another state Again, I want to reiterate that since the Dobbs decision, most abortion providers and OBGYNs in Arizona are confused about what they're legally permitted to do. They're uncertain about how to manage miscarriage, not because we don't know medically how to manage a miscarriage, but because they don't know what's legally allowed. So they have to call a lawyer before they can make decisions that are in their patient's best interest. Find out what the legal obligations are before they can offer pregnant patients the care that they need. What can we do? I send my kids there. A lot of other professors I know send their kids there. But it shouldn't only be for professors' kids. Uh, everyone of reproductive age needs to understand their reproductive health. So we need wider enrollment in these kinds of programs to allow people of reproductive age to understand their reproductive health and how to prevent pregnancy. We also probably need some underground networks providing safe abortions, kind of like the Jane Collective that existed before the Roe v. Wade decision. There are networks now that are working to provide medication abortions, the abortion pills, to women who need abortions. But there are legal risks with that, like we saw with Pervy Patel, and she's not the only one, um, where 
when people obtain a, a, an abortion pill, if they have complications, uh, they can end up in legal jeopardy. Also, some states that are restricting abortion are now passing laws that prohibit their residents from obtaining these pills from out-of-state pharmacies. The other thing we can do is we can fight claims of fetal personhood. We can point out some of the ways that pregnant women lose their rights when we start giving rights to fetuses. Choices about pregnancy are difficult. They're morally fraught. But the best people to make those decisions are mothers and families. It's not that women don't know what they're, what they're deciding when they make those decisions. Uh, it's that they are the best people to make those decisions and take into account the circumstances of their lives and their pregnancies. And we need to remember that no one cares about fetuses and infants more than their mothers. The best way to ensure fetal and infant health is to allow pregnant women to make medical decisions on behalf of both themselves and their babies. Thank you. <laughs>